Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our Lord's house. We're going to begin this morning with the Wells Connection. Hi, I'm Wells President Mark Schrader. By the grace of God and your generous support, Wells has been given countless opportunities to share the life-saving message of the gospel with souls all around the world. Sometimes that's done on a large scale with pre-existing organized church bodies. Other times it's on an individual level with one particular soul and everywhere in between. Todo lo manejaba con lógica, con razón humana, eh, que era el dinero, las mujeres, la ciencia. Todo es, tiene una explicación lógica. Dios para mí no existía. When Camilo Herrera's brother Luis, a Lutheran and a student of Wells Academia Cristo, challenged him to also study the Bible, Camilo felt that it was a good opportunity to have a nice debate with the Christian professor. However, God had different plans. De una de, lo que más fuerte tenía para atacarlo y él llega y me contesta de una forma que nunca una persona me había contestado así, con amabilidad, con amor, con fraternidad. Y ahí fue la primera vez como le dije al pastor a orar, yo nunca había orado, no sabía ni qué era orar. ¿Sí? Y él hizo una oración como una conversación directa con Dios. Yo hice una oración, pero con eufemismo, con, con diciendo, bueno, si usted quiere enseñarme algo, pues estoy abierto, enséñeme. And now, years later, through the work of the Holy Spirit and after multiple courses of studying the Bible with Wells missionaries, Camilo is a Christian who not only confesses that Jesus is his Savior, but who also is passionate about sharing Christ with others. Every Sunday, he closes his restaurant to gather a group for Bible study and worship. Although very special, Camilo's story isn't unique. God the Spirit's transformational work through the Gospel is happening through Wells World Missions in nearly 100 countries around the globe on every inhabited continent. The Lord is using our synod right now in ways that it simply wasn't happening just a short time ago. Uh, the number of people that are connecting with us, the number of people we're able to reach out with, with the gospel. And maybe the, the perspective is, rather than to view them as, as another church, as a different uh, set of, of believers, you know, to, to just recognize that this is our uh, place in the kingdom of God. Many of them are small churches, many of them uh, are struggling to take care of themselves as well. And uh, the Wells is not quite in that same situation. The Lord has blessed us with the means, the resources, that we can be a big catalyst partner to all of these connections worldwide so that, that thousands of people yearly are hearing the gospel in ways they, they never had. The Lord's work through Wells World Missions primarily happens in three ways by partnering with sister church bodies, by providing theological education, and by identifying and recruiting new church planters. Multiplication is a, is a key component in the world mission work. We want to be able to train people to share the gospel with other people, and that they might be able to train those people to share the gospel with other people. And if we can do that level of multiplication, we really can see this as being uh, just hugely impactful. I think it's good to just look a step beyond that and realize how many people are being touched with the means of grace by the people that we are connected to. And we are making plans that by the end of a decade, there will be a million such people in our worldwide fellowship outside of North America. These people may be in faraway lands on the other side of the world, yet they are our brothers and sisters in Christ, children of God, who now have the comfort and certainty of eternal life, knowing that their sins are forgiven. Camilo is one of those people. 
cuál es el problema y si se soluciona el problema. Tengo paz, tengo gozo, tengo gozo al hablar del Señor, tengo paz en Él, no importa qué me pase, tengo paz. Hoy estoy enfermo, eh, sufro de diabetes, tomo 14 pastillas diarias, pues estoy tranquilo. Yo tengo el consuelo del Señor Jesucristo de que cuando termine esto va a estar en el cielo. Entonces, qué más felicidad y qué más gozo. Mientras, tengo que servirle a Él. Y en el tiempo que el tiempo de gracia que Dios quiere que estoy acá, pues le voy a servir a Él de la mejor manera, con lo que pueda. Te lo pedimos, Señor. Amén. What a blessing it is that we all get to be a part of God's work around the world as the rain shower of the gospel passes over various parts of the earth. To learn more about world missions or support those efforts, please visit wells.net forward slash missions. Today in our worship, Jesus teaches us about having proper priorities as his followers. We're going to begin our worship with our first hymn, hymn 753, My Worth is Not in What I Own. That's blessings on your worship today.
Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. <coughs> Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In peace let us pray to the Lord For mercy For the peace from above and for our salvation Let us pray to the Lord For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, whose grace always precedes and follows us, help us forsake all trust and earthly gain and find in you our heavenly treasure. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Second Kings 5. So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept a gift from your servant. The prophet answered, As surely as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. If you will not, said Naaman, please let me, your servant, be given as much earth as a pair of mules can carry. For your servant will never again make burnt offerings and sacrifices to any other God but the Lord. May the Lord forgive your servant for this one thing. When my master enters the temple of Ramon to bow down, and he is leaning on my arm, and I have to bow there also. When I bow down in the temple of Ramon, may the Lord forgive your servant for this. Go in peace, Elisha said. After Naaman had traveled some distance, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said to himself, My master was too easy on Naaman, this Aramean, by not accepting from him what he brought. As surely as the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something from him. So Gehazi hurried after Naaman. When Naaman saw him running toward him, he got down from the chariot to meet him. Is everything all right, he asked. Everything is all right, Gehazi answered. My master sent me to say, two young men from the company of the prophets have just come to me from the hill country of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two sets of clothing. By all means, take two talents, said Naaman. He urged Gehazi to accept them and then tied up the two talents of silver in two bags with two sets of clothing. He gave them to two of his servants and they carried them ahead of Gehazi. When Gehazi came to the hill, he took the things from the servants and put them away in the house. He sent the men away and they left. When he went in and stood before his master, Elisha asked him, Where have you been, Gehazi? Your servant didn't go anywhere, Gehazi answered. But Elisha said to him, Was not my spirit with you when the man got down from his chariot to meet you? Is this the time to take money or to accept clothes or olive groves or vineyards or flocks or herds or male and female slaves? Naaman's leprosy will cling to you and to your descendants forever. And Gehazi went from Elisha's presence and his skin was leprous. It had become as white as snow. The word of the Lord. Hebrews 4. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. The word of the Lord. Please stand. The Gospel according to Mark chapter 10. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, you shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. 
Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. The Gospel of the Lord. You be seated. We invite the children forward for the children's message. I've got two things with me this morning. Let's see if you know what they are. What is this? This is a needle. And you know what this part of the needle is called? This is the string that goes through it. What's the part that the string is in? It's called the eye. Is the eye of a needle pretty big? No, it's very small. You can fit string through it, but not much else. And what is this? This is a horse. I was supposed to bring a camel, but I couldn't find a camel in my house. So we're going to go with a horse right now. Would I be able to put this horse through the eye of a needle? No. And it's not even a real horse. It's definitely not a real camel. Do you know how big camels are? They're huge. A small camel weighs 700 pounds. A big camel weighs over 2,000 pounds. Do you think you could ever put a camel through something this small? No. no, we'd say it would be impossible. It would be impossible to put a camel through something this small. And we just heard Jesus talk about that, didn't we? We just heard Jesus say, it's impossible to put a camel through the eye of a needle, but there's something that's even more impossible than that. The thing that's even more impossible than that is for someone to enter the kingdom of God. Jesus says it's even more impossible for someone to get into heaven than it is to put a whole camel through a really tiny eye of a needle. It's impossible because we're sinful. We do bad things, and so it's impossible for us to get ourselves into heaven. Let me ask you a question, though. Do you think Jesus could make a camel go through the eye of a needle? Yeah, I don't know how he would do it, but Jesus could do it, couldn't he? If Jesus wanted to make a camel go through the eye of a needle, he could either make the camel smaller, he could make the eye of a needle bigger, he could make it happen. Jesus can do impossible things. Jesus can also do the impossible thing of saving us. It might be impossible for us to save ourselves, but it's not impossible for Jesus. Jesus not only can do it, he does it for us. Jesus did the impossible thing of taking our sins away. He did the impossible thing of rising from the dead. He did the impossible thing of working in your heart so you would believe that. It would be impossible for us to ever make ourselves to be believers in Jesus, but Jesus does that impossible thing. He's put faith in your heart so you trust him. It's impossible for us to save ourselves but we can be glad that we have a God who does the impossible for us. Something even more impossible than putting a camel through the eye of a needle. Jesus has made us to be his people, and he saved us. He'll bring us into heaven with him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we admit that it would be impossible for us to save ourselves because of our sin. But we thank you that you have done the impossible for us in making us to be your children, in forgiving our sins, and in one day bringing us into eternal life. We ask that you would keep us trusting in you our whole life through. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can head back to your seats now. Thanks. We continue with our next hymn.
Sell everything you have and give it to the poor. That's what Jesus told that rich young man to do. Jesus was telling him to put his money where his mouth was. This man had come to Jesus asking how he could get eternal life. He came talking a good game about how eternal life was his priority. He came talking a good game about how he had kept God's commandments. So Jesus tells him that he should prioritize treasures in heaven so much that he is willing to give away all of his earthly treasures. But the man can't do it. He goes away sad because despite what he had said, heavenly treasures were not his top priority. His earthly treasures were. Now to be clear, when Jesus told that man to sell everything he had and give it to the poor, this was a command that Jesus gave to that particular man on that particular instance. This is not like a general command that's true for all people of all time. But consider, if Jesus had told you to do that, if he had told you to give away everything that you have, would you do it? Could you do it? Or would a challenge like that pretty quickly reveal about us the same thing that it revealed about that rich young man? That despite what we might say sometimes, heavenly treasures are not always our top priority. Sometimes our earthly treasures are our top priority. And you know, maybe we'd say, well, yeah, if Jesus told me to do that, I would do it, no problem. Give it all away. Of course, it's easy to say that when we know he's probably not going to come and tell us to do that. And if we think we could that easily part with all the things that we have, just consider how much we like to hang on pretty tight the things as it is. Jesus has not told us that we need to give 100% of what he's given us either to him or to other people. But still, Jesus does expect us to be generous towards God in the form of offerings, generous towards others in need with things that he's entrusted to us. So what does the way we currently use our money say about where our priorities are? Do we neglect opportunities for being generous to others in need because our priority is hoarding money for ourselves or spending money on ourselves? Do we neglect opportunities to be generous in the offerings we give because our priority is in hoarding money for ourselves or spending money on ourselves? Again, Jesus never tells you you have to give 100% of your things away. He never puts any number on it at all. But just like with that rich young man, Jesus wants you to put your money where your mouth is. If we say that God and heavenly treasures are our top priority, then the way that we use our earthly treasures should reflect that priority. We never get our priorities completely in line, do we? In fact, we'd have to say that it would be impossible for us to ever get all of our priorities in life exactly lined up the way that they should be because of the sin. And Jesus acknowledges this. He says how hard it is for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When God has given us so much of something, it can become easy for us to start prioritizing that thing even above other things that we know are more important. And just in case we're tempted to think that this is only a problem for super rich people, Jesus opens it up and makes clear he's talking about everybody. He says, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. Whether you are rich or poor or wherever in the middle you might think you are, this is still a spiritual danger for us. There's always still the danger of prioritizing these earthly treasures over things that are really more important. We may find ourselves prioritizing the earthly wealth that we have, the earthly wealth that we spend, the earthly wealth that we want to get for ourselves. This is something that threatens people of, of every economic class. 
And so when Jesus then said that it would be easier to get a camel through the eye of a needle than to get a rich person in the kingdom of God, Jesus' disciples got the point. They said, well, then who can be saved? Can anyone be saved? Since none of us can muster up within ourselves the kind of proper priorities that we need. But what are Jesus' priorities? Let's look at what Jesus is looking at. Right before Jesus tells that rich young man to give away everything he has, it says that Jesus looked at him and loved him. Jesus' heart went out to that man, and that's why he told him to give away everything that he has. Jesus didn't tell him to do that because he was out to get that guy or trying to punish him. This was to help him. Jesus was calling his heart back to him. Jesus wanted to show him where his priorities were misplaced so that he could then give him something even better. And that is how Jesus reacts to us. Now, to be clear, our misplaced priorities, our tendency of prioritizing earthly treasures over heavenly treasures, our tendency of prioritizing God's gifts to us over God himself, these are all sins, and Jesus is not happy about them. He makes no excuses for you, and he accepts no excuses from you. But as Jesus is showing you where your priorities are misplaced, he is looking at you, and he is loving you. He doesn't do this because he's out to get you. He doesn't do this because he's out to punish you. He's trying to help you. He's trying to call your heart closer back to himself. He wants to show you where your priorities are misplaced so that he can give you something even better because Jesus does the impossible for you. That rich young man thought it would be impossible for him to ever get his priorities enough in line to be saved. Jesus' disciples thought that it would be impossible for anyone to ever get their priorities enough in line to be saved. And when we look at the sinfulness of our heart, we've got to admit that it would be impossible for us to ever get our priorities enough in line to be saved. And Jesus agrees. He says, with man, this is impossible. But not with God. All things are possible with God. Jesus did the impossible for you. Keeping God's commandments, that was impossible for you, but not for Jesus. Jesus did it for you his whole life through. Maintaining proper priorities, that was impossible for you, but not for Jesus. Jesus did that for you with everything he did. Getting rid of your sin, that was impossible for you, but not for Jesus. Jesus did that for you when he died. Overcoming death, that was impossible for you, but not for Jesus. Jesus did that for you when he rose. And even overcoming your natural tendency to prioritize earthly things over heavenly things, that was impossible for you too, but not for Jesus. Jesus did that for you when in love he brought you into the kingdom of God. In your baptism, Jesus did the impossible for you. He squeezed a camel like you through the eye of a needle and brought you to trust in him. No, you don't trust him perfectly. No, your priorities aren't perfect either. But Jesus continues to do the impossible for you. He continues to keep you trusting in him. He continues to keep you seeing the great things he's done for you in love to save you. He keeps you looking at those heavenly treasures that he has for you in himself as a free gift. He keeps you looking forward to that eternal life which he himself will bring you into one day. You are not saved because of how well you prioritize God and his heavenly treasures for you. You are saved because of how well your God prioritizes you and on giving you those heavenly treasures in his son Jesus. And so then it turns out that with a God that good, a savior that good, heavenly treasures that good, you do have something that's worth prioritizing in everything you do. Amen. Please stand.
we confess our shared Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Lord God, from whom all blessings flow, we praise you for everything you provide to sustain our lives. Lead us every day to be thankful for your gifts and content with what you have given. Today we pray that you would guide us to manage your blessings wisely for the good of your kingdom. Before your Son ascended to your throne, he called us to preach the good news to every creature. In grace, you created the public ministry so that we may answer his call by sending others in our place. Impress on us the immense importance of the task you have given us to proclaim your word to the world. Work in our hearts so that our gifts do more than support a cause or meet a need. Move us to give out of love for you, our King and Redeemer. Lead us to bring our gifts first to honor you, the giver of all things. Teach us to give as an ongoing part of life, since the work of the gospel continues every day. Forgive us for the sins of apathy and carelessness, and forgiving that reacts only to urgent pleas or crises. Teach us to determine our offerings in view of your blessings to us. The widow's coins were meager, but they were all she had. Move us to believe that to whom much is given, much is also expected. Give us courage to bring gifts that reflect your gifts to us. Teach us to give our offerings as a cheerful response of our faith in you and your son. Spare us all feelings of obligation or resentment as we give. Help us to see our offerings as the vehicle that carries the gospel to the lost and lead us to rejoice with the angels of heaven over every sinner who repents. Help us to balance our duty to give with the joy of giving. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. Precious Lord, all our blessings come from you. Lead us again and again to thank you, and then move us to be wise and faithful stewards of your gifts. May our gifts and offerings bring souls here and far away to the gracious gift of Jesus and his love. We continue with our next hymn. Thank you. 
please stand. Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated for our closing hymn. Once again, a good morning to everyone. Great to worship with you today. A special welcome to any guests and visitors we have with us today. It's great having you here. We hope you join us again as you're able to do so. Um, all of you are invited to join us next Sunday. Next Sunday is the conclusion of our series, The Need for Followership. We talk about how followers of Christ make selfless sacrifices as we follow a Savior who sacrificed himself for us. 
Um, with this coming weekend being MEA, we're not going to have catechism on Wednesday night. We're also not going to have um, Sunday school or Bible class next week Sunday. Um, it says in the bulletin we're having them. We're not having them next week Sunday, so don't come here for those. We are still having service, though, so join us for that. And there's also a couple things that we're doing today. Right after service, we're going to have another call meeting to extend a call for a permanent pastor. Stick around for that. And then we're also having our first monthly potluck dinner in the basement. Um, the second Sunday of every month, we're going to try having a fellowship meal come together as a church family. So stick around for that today as well. Have a good week and God bless.